Oh, Professor Allison, I have a topic. Good, good. The citizenship versus sovereignty. Okay. That I think sounds that's good. Yeah. That's, and if you have a minute after class, can I talk to you? Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, that was fun. Um, so each of you, had, each group had a different map from the Leventhal Map Center, and then each of you was able to spend some time with it. Now what we'll do is, you know, each group will tell the rest of the class what it was they found. So why don't we, let's see, start with um, Molly, Savannah, and um, Alessandro in their map. And if one of you can show it to the rest of us, that would help too. Okay. I'll share my screen. So, Let's see if I well, can okay. zoom out. Oh, actually, this one. Okay, so this is showing like the concentration of like buffalo across America is what we figured out. Hmm. So like the blue is like from 1800, and then like the orange is from 1875, I think. And the map was made in 1876. Wow. So. Yeah. And so something that we noticed was that like the Buffalo concentration, like in 1800, like went all the way from here to here, but then it all started shrinking in from like both sides, like from all sides at once. Hmm. Thought was strange. That is interesting. So the blue was around 18, then what's the purple that you see? Um, the pink is from 1800 to 1825. Okay, good. And then, and then 1825 to 1850, 1850 wow. to 1875. And then this was like in 1875. Wow, wow. Great. Is there any other explanation on it that uh, tells us more? Or is that, I mean, it's pretty self explanatory. Um, in the description, so it says like the company that made it. Mm -hmm. um, but in the description, like below the map, it like says that um, the decrease was because of like railroad expansion from the settlers. Mm -hmm. And um, it also like hurt the Native Americans a lot because they lost their food source because mm -hmm. The um, settlers were like killing bison to use it for like leather goods and to, um, mm -hmm. and they were selling the bones to make like fine china. Wow. Um, how big was this map? Did you see that? In the... Um, I think it says below it. Maybe. 62 by 73 centimeters. Okay, so uh, I still think in inches, so I'm not quite sure how big that is. Um, so that's like 120. No, it's half that. It would be like 30 inches because every centimeter or every inch is two and a half centimeters. Okay. So, so it would be like almost three feet by yeah it would be like three feet by three and a half feet okay so it's a pretty big size good size yeah okay um wow anything else anything you couldn't figure out by looking at the map um something that um savannah mentioned was they're like really tiny like these really small dots yeah. of where um, bison still were. Wow, interesting. So, um, we yeah, I thought that sure. was interesting because yeah. you didn't see like any other color there. Yeah. And then it disappeared a few like decades later. That's interesting. So they persisted there in the 
along the Ohio and the Mississippi for you know quite a while. And, you know, that is interesting. Um, that's very good. Very. Anyone, anyone have questions about this map? Anyone regret that their group didn't get the bison map? Because this this was an interesting one. Okay. Well, let's thank you. Uh, so let's see, why don't we have, um, let's see, Santa, Andrew, and Patrick, and Tessa, and tell us what you looked up. That was a good job. Uh, I guess I'll talk. Uh, Great. We looked at, should I share my screen? Yeah, please. Okay, let me see. This works. Everyone can see it. Yeah, a nice colorful map. So we have this map of America showing, from what we can tell, it's basically a census of where each uh, tribe is and what area they're in, mm -hmm. as well as their numbers. So over okay. here, we have like a key. Wow. Say how many members or how many Indians are east hmm. of Mississippi? in total 26,000. Wow. wow. How many have been removed from the east to the mm -hmm. west of the Mississippi? We see 77,000. Wow. And then west of the Mississippi, east of the Rockies is 213. I think that's 6,000. Wow. Interesting. Um, so this map was made in 1844, I think it says. Yeah, 1844. Mm -hmm. Um, it's actually printed in London. Yeah, in London wow. by Bowden James, apparently. Okay. Or James Bowden. James Bowden, okay. So, yeah. But doesn't tell us anything about what's west of the Rockies. No, not really. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so it sounds like you got a lot out of it. Um, any questions you have after having pondered the map for a bit? Things you couldn't um, figure out? The one thing I was thinking is on each of these colored sections, not these ones, but each mm -hmm. of these, it says yearly meeting on each mm -hmm. color. Mm -hmm. We're not entirely sure what that denotes. Um, it was the um, Quaker meetings, but like we don't know. Yeah. Other than that. Yeah. Like what made these different boundaries? It was probably, I don't know, it could have been people that were trying to convert the Native Americans to Christianity, but we don't really know. Okay. Professor Is, Allison? Yes. Um, Wasn't it like for, you keep bringing up the maps, wasn't something I read earlier on, didn't they make, were, were, wasn't the Native Americans that, um, like the, some areas were they named after something like that? Am I, am I reading something wrong? Yeah, there are areas named after Native Americans, yeah. Like, and there are something like that, or like the first, I don't know, on them, I don't know, like they're the creation of the maps? I have no idea. I don't something know. Something like that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, is, uh, the dean keeps telling me not to ask people about their religious affiliation, but is there anyone here who's a Quaker who can tell us what it means, the Society of Friends annual meeting? Even if you're not a Quaker and you know that uh, um, the annual meeting is just the jurisdiction. You, you would belong to the annual meeting in a certain area and um, the yearly meeting. I'm inferring from this, since it's printed in London and there are um, members of the Society of Friends in London, that this is probably for their interest, thinking uh, what annual meeting, you know, they wanna know two things, I guess, where are the native people and then which annual meeting would they go to if they wanted to become members of the Society of Friends. Another thing I find kind of interesting is this orange line here and then this green line that it intersects with if you go west. Any sense of what that is? Hmm. 
And you can see, if you look closely, you can see this orange line kind of then intersects with the green line here along the um, Savin River and then along the Red River. And then it turns north uh, on the western side of the Indian Territory. And then it kind of follows, I think, probably the uh, river um, to the north. Fascinating map. Well, they're the, not buffer zones, are they? Um, well, you're close. They're borders. Um. Can you give us a hint? Well, it is a border. Border from like another. The um, the orange is the border of what in 1844 would have been claimed as the Republic of Texas, and the green is the border between the United States and with Texas, and then as you get up into the Rockies with Mexico, so um, yeah. that's the so. Right. Well, the United States is north and east of the Green Line, which is why it doesn't tell us much about the Indians west of the Rockies, because oh. that's part of Mexico and not part of the United States. Who was the president again around that era? Well, there are a few. There, are, there was uh, one like there was one like up in um, like Washington, right up there or something. Well, Washington was the capital. Yeah. So. But there is, you know, I don't remember. I know what you're talking about. I just can't put my finger on it. Well, they were fighting for that. They were fighting for Texas, you know, and there's people that wanted to move out of Texas or something, right? No, no one's ever wanted to move out of Texas. Or, or, or I don't know, maybe I'm confused with the Mexicans. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so there's going to be a war starting the next year over Texas and you know, by the end of the war in 1848, um, all of that territory will be part of the United States. So this is this moment just before the war, which makes it really interesting. Uh, I didn't want to give this away because we do have another map that's also looking at the same place. So that's good. Okay, thank you guys. Um, let's see, why don't we have, um, let's see, Lucy and Alex and uh, Hunt, um, Harrison show us what they figured out from their map. I'll share my screen, hopefully. Okay, we're all good, we can see it? Yeah, Great. good. Okay, so our map is uh, made in 1834. It is the area kind of, well, you can see as we go in here, um, of Missouri, mm -hmm. Arkansas, and then kind of this ambiguous territory that in the 1830s has been allocated to the different tribes, especially um, in the American Southeast. And as we go through, we can kind of just see the different land allotments um, for the different tribes, the biggest ones being down in this area, um, the Choctaw uh, Creek, Cherokee. Um, and then you also have these really interesting, like tiny pieces in here mm -hmm. where they're like a ridiculously small portion yeah. of land mm -hmm. and very strange borders that you can see in some places are, you know, very straight corresponding well, yeah. with these dashed lines. And then in other places, they're following rivers. So that was one question that we had was, you know, you kind of have to get in the mind of a, a map maker in the 1830s mm -hmm. to understand why they made the borders where they did. Um, but it does seem, we were talking about it, it seems kind of arbitrary the way the borders were drawn. Um, and it's both, I think, the alloc the drawing of the borders, but also it's the allocation of the land and how that was decided on. And that's uh, that's that's another interesting question. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. I mean, I guess you have to assume it's based somehow on population because you know the ones that we hear more about, the ones that are more prominent, like the Cherokees and the Choctaws, mm -hmm. have like a good amount of land. But like, I don't know the some of the ones that you don't necessarily hear of a lot because maybe they're not that big at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they're getting really small portions of land. Um, yeah, that's interesting. The other thing that we have in the map that's kind of interesting is that we do see areas of land that mm -hmm. were purchased um, probably 
um, by the U.S. government from the tribes when they were trying to, you know, sell the land once they got a lot of pressure to do that. Yeah. And then also lands that are ceded as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because you can see the Saxon foxes ceded this blue or yellow, and then they moved yeah. to the blue there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting map. It's also it really pretty is. small. Um, yeah. I I I think we settled on the fact that it was inches, um, mm. but it's like 18 by 17 inches so it's wow. pretty small so we yeah. kind of figured it was some sort of like pocket guide or, so, mm -hmm. or something because it's not like a table map so yeah pretty small interesting yeah. and who made it um it says anonymous here we're assuming that's who donated it and mm -hmm. then i think oh no oh i can't get to it from here <laughs> hold on i can probably figure out how to do this okay then i think down here yeah it says um Washington Hood, I guess, seems like hmm. maybe he was yeah, the maybe. he was the yeah. that made it. That makes that's, sense. That's kind of what we have on it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. Think anyone else have questions for um, on this map? It's not as Trevor, interesting. Trevor as has a little. question. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's a question that like. I mean, them will be able to answer, but it's more for you. Um, were land purchases of like such a small size, like commonplace for the U.S. government from the natives? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you know, because sometimes that's what they had or what they wanted, and maybe they were going to then allocate it to someone else. So, um, yeah. Um, and, and you do see a lot of, um, often it's an incremental purchasing of land, um, you know, rather than, you know, I think the more unusual ones are the bigger ones that we know more about, like, uh, you know, the whole uh, session of Alabama by the Creeks in 1814, um, you know, but then usually you're gonna see smaller ones and it is really chipping away a territory. Uh, and then usually, and so then usually the thinking is, okay, they'll have the residue. We saw that kind of in Florida where, you know, okay, you can keep this chunk of it for the next 20 years, um, but then we're going to come back and want more. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. It's an interesting observation you had. Um, any other questions for me or for Lucy and the rest of her group? Okay, then, um, then we'll have a Trevor, Chuddy, and um, Jeff, and Sam. Want to tell us about what you found in your map, which has a relationship to one of the couple of the others we've seen. Would somebody else mind like screen sharing it? I just was looking at my phone, so I don't have it up. You were looking at your phone. I appreciate the honesty people have. No, I was looking at the and, map on my phone. Oh, the map. You were looking at the map, the map on your phone. You weren't. I can share my screen if that's easy. Great, great. All right. Wow. Oh no, I'm doing full screen. There it is. Okay. Um, over there. Um, I mean, over here you can see all the um, board, all the um, what's it called, the borders or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, right here is usually where uh, Mexico was. Um, is that well that's yeah. the, the territory that they're occupying um also well i mostly was focusing on the tables right here mm -hmm. i kind of um figure out what the um triangle was but this is basically a table of distance um from here is from mexico to a city uh, named veracruz and then from mexico to town pico mm -hmm. so it's basically um uh, the, the mileage between each towns uh 
This is the uh, table of um, statistics. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just telling us like um, each each state what the population in it is and um, the mileage from like what is it called? Um, I can't. I can't. This is mostly in Spanish, so I couldn't really like. Yeah, it has the latitude and the longitude of yeah. places. So they were doing that whole geocoding thing and right there. So. Yeah. And then um, I didn't know, uh, I had a question about the bottom. I didn't mm -hmm. really know what this is, um, what it was trying to tell us. This that, that's the road from uh, Veracruz to Mexico City and then to the, uh, yeah, um, that's interesting. So good. And did others in the group look more, I mean, you did a good job of deciphering the tables. Did anyone else take a look at the map and figure out what that's showing us? Because the map's all in Spanish, uh, as uh, Shadi mentioned. Where was it, uh, who made it and where was it published? Was it published in Mexico? Um, so it was made in 1846. The author is, uh, his name is right here, um, John de Sternel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think was um, from what I looked up, he's basically just like a travel guide writer and mm. cartographer. Okay. Yeah. And where is he? Where was it printed or published? New York, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. there's a map of Mexico published in New York, but it's in Spanish. So it's um, meant, I think, uh, who do you think it's meant for? It was made just after Texas was annexed. So yeah. my kind of theory was that it was showing the new territories of the continent, like divided among the three major players. Okay. So does it tell us who owns Texas at this point? No. Um, from what I could understand, what's in the yellow border is probably kind of US territory and what is in red, what's in the red water would be Spanish territory. So it said that Southern Arkansas. And if you look at the bottom of the map, like go down to like mm -hmm. South America, mm -hmm. uh, I believe the yellow part is supposed to be Guatemala. And from what I was reading, Guatemala at the time was, I believe part of American territory. Really? Where did you find that? I was just looking up to see if like it was part of, I'm just looking up to see if like Guatemala was like considered US territory at the time. And was it? I believe it said like 1836, but I could be wrong. Hmm. Yeah, I think you may be, I mean, it's an interesting conjecture, but um, to my knowledge, no Guatemala has never been United States territory. Um, I, I think, you know, that's interesting. You're, we're trying to figure this out using the colors. And, you know, sometimes the colors are simply a way of distinguishing one place from another. Um, so, you know, Arkansas is definitely part of the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's not entirely clear why they have those states so clearly defined, Arkansas, Louisiana, Missouri, and then others aren't. Um, I don't know why. Um, and I can't, I mean, again, you're the guys looking at the map, so I'm not going to tell you what I, I'm seeing in it, but that's, that's fascinating the way, um, someone in New York, um, by the way, um, isn't there a war between the United States and Mexico around this time? That's right. I mean, they don't really like isn't it. There, isn't there? Uh, Yeah. Again, it's unfair of me, you know, obviously I'm the one who should know this, um, but um, yeah, uh, and, and it starts, I think, around 1846, so at about the same time this map is made, um, which it raises a lot of questions for me about who's, does the guy, who is he selling the map to, if it's in Spanish, uh, but then it's printed in New York, it's called Nuevo York, um, and, you know, it does show the, um, the United States of Mexico. 
I'd, I'd like to know, I, I'd like to know more about the guy, the map maker and what other maps he makes. Cause this is, it's a fascinating map. And then he has all of this really interesting detail that Shadi was sharing with us. Um, and you know, Texas is still kind of a mystery because Mexico doesn't recognize the session of Texas, that Texas is part of the United States. That's the reason there's a war. Um, you know, and a uh, long complicated story. And then this, what's going to happen with this Western territory of Mexico. Uh, most of that is going to become part of the United States by the treaty in 1848. Um, but at this time, it is all part of Mexico. What is now, you know, uh, so that, that's inter very a very interesting map. Um, what else did you? Whether well, you have any other questions from it, or things you uh, are puzzled by about the, the map? Uh, not really for me. Okay. It's good. You know, they, they tell us some things. There are other things. I mean, you do, do need to look at a lot of them in conjunction and just try to figure out what it is the map maker is trying to convey and why they made this particular map. And um, Did you tell us how big this one was? Kim? You mean the scale? Yeah, just, yeah. I mean, would this be meant to hang on a wall? Was it folded up in a book? Was it... Um, it says the scale is... Um... Four million five hundred thousand. Okay. So. Uh, the dimensions were about like seventy-four by ninety centimeters, so like probably like twenty-nine inches by thirty-five. Okay, that's a you know good size. Okay, good. Very interesting. And what about this eagle up here on the right? The um, what's going on with that? Oh, isn't this like, isn't like Abraham Lincoln coming after this? I don't see him in this. No, but it's like, they're going to attack, like, they're going to like, like some, it's something they're going to, there's going to be some like, even after the whole Mexican war or whatever, there, there's, it, I can't remember, like two semesters ago, like, um, there, there's going to be a big war. Uh, yeah, but right like, now, let's right totally, now let's just like, look at this. Like, right yeah. now, just look at this eagle and see what it's all about. Um, it's like representing America or something. What um, does it say? If I What's... could interject, that's it, it's the opposite. This is a Mexican map. Yeah. Right. So, so it's the, so this is like the symbol Republic. of Mexico. The Republica Federalis de Mexicana. So it's the Federal Republic of Mexico. With the and Mexico has an eagle too. In fact, the. Mexican eagle was on their dollars. So that's is kind of a big, and what is there writing on these, what look like uh, leaves the eagle is sitting on? Uh, I think this is a tree with all the, like the leaves are like all the states. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No. So it is a map made to be sold in Mexico. Yeah. at a time when the United States is at war with Mexico, which is you know, really fascinating. On the wow. And then this, uh, and the, the Liberty cap above the eagle. Yeah. And the eagle, again, this is the Mexican symbol with the eagle attacking the snake. Mm -hmm. So this guy in New York, uh, yeah, it's actually on Broadway in New York, knows a lot about what's going on with Mexico. Weren't like a lot of academics at the time opposed to the Mexican war in America? Well, I don't know that there were that many academics running around. So you think I was around then opposing the Mexican war? Uh, no, I, I was all for it at the time. No, uh, New England was definitely opposed to the Mexican war for the most part. Um, yeah, uh, but um, popular in other parts of the country. So yeah. Um, I, I suppose you have that same kind of, um, you know, uh, well, the academics of the time, such as they were, would have opposed the war. I don't think they were quite as noisy then as they have been are now. Uh, fewer people were going to college. So there's, a, you know, there's only a handful of colleges, probably 90% of the population doesn't even think about going to college. Um, and in fact, Mm, very few even go to high school. 
Um, you know, but there are newspapers and things, and newspapers take different positions on the war with Mexico, just as they take different positions on the war with the native people. Um, you know, I, I think we're often deceived by how things are now and imagine there must always have been some kind of intellectual class running around doing what they do now. Um, I was expecting somebody's going to tweet something I'm saying about you know, my disdain for the academy. Um, but no, don't, don't share that. Um, but, uh, don't tell Professor Reeve um, or the dean. But no. Um, yeah, yeah, so there is this, uh, you know, uh, this is when um, Henry David Thoreau goes to jail for refusing to pay his taxes because he thinks his taxes are going to support the war with Mexico. And John Quincy Adams, who was a congressman from Massachusetts, he wants Congress to cut off funding for the army. In 1846, after the war's begun, there's a congressional election and the Whigs win. Uh, the, Santa was asking earlier who was the president then, and I didn't want to betray it, but uh, James K. Polk elected president in 1844 and wants to expand the country. In fact, his campaign slogan is 5440 or fight. That is the United States will go to war unless the British concede all of British Columbia is part of the United States. And uh, that doesn't happen. It, one of the earlier maps we showed, we saw, I think it was, um, Group twos had the northern border, and you saw it kind of broke in, um, you know, went as far as the Rockies, and then west of that, there wasn't a border between the United States and British Canada. Um, yeah, and that's only decided um, under in a treaty in the same period, um, the Webster Ashburton Treaty. If you're ever wondering why Ashburton Place is named Ashburton Place, it's because of Lord Ashburton and he and Daniel Webster made this treaty that uh, extended the border to the Pacific. But anyway, um, you have all of that's happening at this time and Polk um, is the president during this war, but he's the Demo Demo Democrat and then the Whigs win the elections in 1846 and then Congress you know, when um, Adams wants to cut off funding for the army, so let them walk home, we'll end the war simply by stopping paying for it. So there is this opposition to the war in New England. And um, yeah, and, and also there is a, um, another issue. I'm sorry, you now I'm taking away from the really good story you guys were telling. I think Trevor knows how to get me distracted, get him talking about something else. and. Um, Actually, two of the general officers I was talking about with the Seminole War are involved in the war with Mexico. Um, Zachary Taylor is the one who starts it by leading his troops across the uh, Nueces River and then across the and uh, into territory the United States claimed that Mexico also claimed, and that's where the war begins. And then um, President Polk sends General Winfield Scott to actually goes from Veracruz to Mexico City, which is very nicely marked out on this map. So I wonder if General Scott carried this map along with him to see the best route from Veracruz to Mexico City. And so by the um, 1847, the United States is occupying Mexico City. And uh, Me this is when Mexico cedes much of this territory to the United States, but that's good. Very interesting looking at this map. Well, I think all of you did a really good job uh, explaining the maps that you had never seen before. Um, I think I might continue doing this with uh, other classes too, just showing them, having them look at something and try to figure it out because it saves me having to explain things. Um, good, any further questions on any of this? What's here, what isn't here? Uh, are there native people on this map, Chadi or Trevor or Sam, did you get, or Jeff, did you get any native people? Yeah, I think so. Um... I was, that's what I was, I think that's what I was confused about too, is either the green or the red. I think that's like um, Native American occupation maybe. No, th those are just state boundaries. Okay. Um, Where Oklahoma would be is Indian territory. And then there's a lot of like Comanche and Pueblo in Mexico. Okay. So there are Native people. Um, yeah. Interesting. Well, very interesting. Okay, good. Um, well, let's see. Um, I guess you can um, stop sharing the screen unless we wanted to do a good job, everybody. And let me see, there are a couple of other things. I thought, you know, we could shift our, well, we have about 10 minutes left and um, I could go on or I could let you go. 
Um, let me just um, talk very briefly about the buffalo. We're going to shift our attention next to the Great Plains, where much of the action happens. In fact, um, between about 1820 and 1860, that part of the country, according to one historian, is the most contested area in North America, uh, the plains. It's contested among a lot of people. Of course, there are the Americans, but also there are different native people vying for control in the Great Plains. And um, at this time, there's something like 27 million bison. Uh, that's one of the figures here. And the native people on the plains really lived by hunting bison. And every year they would harvest about 450,000 a year. Now that and typically, they, they knew which ones they were looking for. They usually were male bison between the ages of two and four. So it's not an indiscriminate, let's go out and get bison. They're looking for bison that have a certain kind of meat. And this whole process on the plains had been going on for quite a while. And by the uh, first decades of the 19th century, the groups, the, the two native groups most engaged here were the Sioux and the um, Cheyenne. And the, um, it, it, and we're just now really figuring out the whole patterns here. Um, the, the, they come from different language groups. Let me just kind of sketch this out. There are, were on the plains, uh, five or six different language groups. The Cheyenne, along with the Blackfeet, the Arapaho, and the Cree, are Algonquian speakers. That is the same language a group spoken on the east coast of North America. Then the Crow, the Sioux, the Hidatsa, the Mandan, the Assiniboine are all Sioux. The Sioux is a language group. And the name itself actually Sioux is a French word that's a French translation of an Ojibwe word, Nadoe Isu, Nadoe Isu. And in Ojibwe, that means the lesser adders. An adder is a kind of snake. So the Ojibwe called the Iroquois the greater adders, and the Ojibwe, who were in what is today Minnesota, had been kind of pressed between these two different groups, the Iroquois and the um, Sioux. Um, Anton Troyer, who was with us last week, is in Ojibwe. And, um, and, and what was happening in this era, era in really in the 17th century, the 16th and 17th century, was there was a big fight going on over furs. The French were trying to get more furs and the Iroquois and different groups in uh, what is now Canada were coming further west to get more furs, typically beaver pelts. And the two main, main fur resources were, fur, were uh, beavers and bison. And so the Ojibwe were kind of pressed between the Iroquois and the um, Sioux. And so they called these, the Sioux, Nadoia Sioux, and the French heard that and called them Sioux. So that's who they are. And actually there are seven different bands of the Sioux. It gets even more complicated and confusing as we go on. Um, so um, there's really no central government among the Sioux. There are seven different bands and roughly those bands are in three main groups. There's a Western group, the Lakota or Teton. And then there's the group along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, the Yanktonay or Nakota, and then the easternmost band or the Santee. And they um, don't have a central government and they do travel uh, following the buffalo herds. And the buffalo, lots of different native people are following the buffalo. As uh, the map we saw earlier showed how many buffalo there were, tremendous resource and the buffalo typically would winter in the Black Hills and then move across the plains and further east. These huge numbers of these, and by the way, technically they are bison and not buffalo. 
uh, buffalo are indigenous to Asia, bison are indigenous to North America, and tremendous numbers of them in the central part of the continent, wintering in the Black Hills and then moving south to, uh, following the grain. Um, and so the Sioux had been mainly in the area of uh, Minnesota and so they may have been even further east and they are kind of pushed west in this war going on between the Iroquois and the Huron over access to furs. And other native people who find themselves on the plains or we find on the plains also had moved west. So among the other groups are the people who speak a Caddoan language, the Pawnee and the Arakara. And they also had come from the area of Kentucky. They probably followed the Buffalo. The map we saw the Buffalo showed the Buffalo in Kentucky. These folks had moved west as the Buffalo had been depleted. They're moving further west. And then there are the people who speak the Aztecan, Uto Aztecan language groups, the Shoshone, the Comanche, the Shoshone are further north, the Comanche further south, and then the Utah, Ute, who are in what is today Utah. And then the Athabascan language, those are the Kiowa, Apache, the Navajo. And so you have um, these different language groups here and people who are following a relatively similar way of life, but are at war over the buffalo. So anyway, seven bands of the Sioux, and they are going to come to be literally the dominant group on the plains along with the Cheyenne. And the Cheyenne are nomadic people, uh, and they spend most of the year divided into small, very small groups. And they never camp in one place for more than five days. But every summer, at the beginning of every summer, they all come together for this communal ceremonies and then communal hunting. Now, like the Sioux, the Cheyenne are relatively recent arrivals on the Great Plains. By the, um, they had arrived sometime in the 18th century on the Plains. And by the 19th century, the Cheyenne and the Sioux, these semi-nomadic groups really are dominating life on the Great Plains and are more successful at it than the others. And the word Cheyenne itself is a mistranslation of their name. It's actually the Sioux who misunderstand it. Um, the Cheyenne called themselves first Neomateaninia, which means the desert people or prairie people. And the Sioux, the um, Sioux call them um, Shanila or Shanina, which means people who speak a language we don't understand. Okay, so that's how they come to go Cheyenne because the Sioux said they don't, they speak, someone asked the Sioux who they are and they said, well, they speak a language we don't understand. And there were farming people on the plains, mainly along those rivers that we saw on the maps, and the Mandan, the Otto, the Hadatsa, the Pawnee. And let's see, uh, I think we'll call it a day and we'll begin next week with the Cheyenne and the Sioux, the exciting stories of life on the plains. And let me also point out to you that on the uh, Blackboard site, I've posted this five-part mini-series about the Great Plains that um, you know, you can watch with great enjoyment. And also, I think I put up a link or sent you a link about this uh, great um, Netflix series I saw on a basketball team from a high school, uh, a Navajo uh, basketball team, which is worth seeing. So um, that's it for me. I will let you go. I think, uh, Santa, do you want, still want to talk yeah. for a few minutes? Yeah, okay, yeah. So. I don't know if you can like put us in another room or something. Okay, so does anyone else have any questions before we call it a night? Okay, well, thank you. You did a great job. Thank you for explain, looking at the maps, explaining the maps. And if you have more questions about your projects, give, send me an email, okay? Thank you. So take care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.